So welcome everyone, I'm Sam Charrington. I'm the founder of Twimmel and I'm excited to have Robert Ness here. Robert's a ML scientist and professor and instructor uh, and creator of the course Causality and Probabilistic Modeling. Actually, that's not the official title, that's the title of the webinar. What's the official title of the course? Causal Modeling and Machine Learning? Causal Modeling and Machine Learning, yeah. And Machine Learning. Uh, Robert and I have been working together to bring this course to the Twimmel community for about a year and a half. In fact, uh, it was probably, we were meeting in, uh, we met at NeurIPS in Vancouver, you know, maybe one of the last places that, uh, either of us yeah, yeah. traveled pre pandemic. Yeah, that's right. Last one. <laughs> kind of hatched this scheme. Um, and uh it's been it's been a lot of fun to to work together we've this is maybe the fifth cohort of the course that uh we've collaborated on and we've gotten some really amazing feedback from students um but the way robert likes to approach this webinar is to make sure that everyone who's here leaves with something and so he's got a lot of content on causality and causal modeling kind of a, an intro or uh, a blitz and so we'll kind of get into that but uh did want to give robert an opportunity to kind of say hi and introduce uh himself so robert yeah thanks for um that introduction sam and um yeah it has been interesting working with uh well your students in particular students coming from the tomo community have been the most involved in the course it's a cohort based course right so that means that we have weekly calls and we talk about the lectures and, you know, and during, and I also, and during COVID, I had to do the same thing with my Northeastern students and uh, Northeastern uh, graduate students to some extent have, you know, they tend to kind of turn off the camera and you're like staring at this big matrix of names <laughs> and you have no idea if people are even hearing <laughs> anything. And, uh, um, and some of the, some of the students in the professional workshop are like that, but the Twimmel students are always super gung ho and take in, they, they book time with the, with me and the other instructors, they show up for, um, they show up for the retrospectives each week. And, uh, a lot of them have gone on to kind of form the, the form reading groups. And we, we have weekly reading groups talking about, uh, the literature and application. And so it's been really, it's, for me, it's been a really rewarding, uh, um, collaboration. Nice. Um, and would you want to share a little bit about your background and kind of how you came into causal modeling? Yeah. So I'm a PhD statistician. I work as a machine learning research scientist at a startup focused mostly on natural language understanding uh, and um, working mostly with Python. I, before that, I was, um, uh, in fact, most of my professional work has concerned kind of building in production uh, systems for uh, probabilistic reasoning under uncertainty. And uh, aside from that, I write a lot of, I teach a lot, I'm writing a textbook right now on uh, uh, causal machine learning. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, most of it. I, uh, so yeah, my, my philosophy about uh, causal modeling, modeling in general is that we want to kind of uh, combine these ideas from traditional causal inference theory with generative machine learning and what's shaping out to be a, a kind of new paradigm of neurosymbolic artificial intelligence. Uh, I think there's a, and I think not only can we build powerful uh, 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 reasoning systems using this technology, but we can ask, we can also enjoy ourselves a lot more because these types of models are generally funner to work with than, they, than their typical kind of black box machine learning model. Awesome. So if you let me, are you ready for me to drive in or are we going uh, to? I'm actually, I've got a couple more screens that I want to, uh, or slides that I want to pull up uh, in case any of our audience uh, is not familiar with Twimmel and what we're all about. Um, we're fundamentally about um, making ML and AI more accessible to uh, to our learners, our community of learners and practitioners. And in particular, we care a lot about 
um, kind of amplifying uh, the broad community of uh, diverse voices in the ML and AI community. Uh, so if you you know came to this via social media and you're not already familiar with us, uh, I of course host the Twimmel AI podcast and encourage you to check that out. And uh, we also host a very active community of which this uh, course and study group is just uh, one element. And you can learn more about that via twimmelai.com slash community. And uh, please join us, all are welcome. And uh, once you do that, you will receive an invitation to our Slack. Uh, and that's where a lot of the conversation uh, happens. Uh, essentially, we're a community of folks that are excited about ML and AI and learning together. And there are lots of great opportunities to, uh, to learn with other folks. Uh, and so with that, Robert, we can get your slides up and have you jump into your, uh, your intro. You're muted, I think. A year in, to, over a year in. And <laughs> Somebody uh, at uh, one of our recent events had this amazing quote that I uh, said, if 2020 had a t-shirt, it would say on it, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're coming at causal modeling, causal inference from a data science perspective, uh, bear with me, I'll get to I'll get to some of those points in a second, or we can have a conversation about it after I give this pitch. Uh, and I think what's really interesting now is that you had the AI community kind of looking at causality. Like, you, so speaking of 2020 memes, there's, you know, there's that meme of the, uh, of the guy with his girlfriend looking at the other girl that's passing by, like that's the, the guy is the AI community and, and, the, and the, the, the woman walking by is, uh, causality. And then, and the girlfriend is, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, deep learning or canonical deep learning. Or <laughs> but, um, and so, and that's an interesting kind of development because what's happened is that we're seeing that there's some, uh, there's some problems, causal problems that need solving. So for example, uh, we want to be able to compute on agent psychology, right? So we have an, we're modeling, we're modeling an agent, or we have a learning agent. So we want to be able to do things like quantify intention, blame, regret, responsibility. And Judea Pearls or Yuda Pearls is pronounced Yuda. Yuda Pearls, uh, Book of Why. He has a quote: "When my house robot turns on the vacuum cleaner while I'm asleep, and I tell it, it should have woken me up, I want it to understand the vacuuming wasn't at fault, but I don't want it to interpret the complaint as an instruction never to vacuum the upstairs again." So this is that the, we want an agent that understands which of, its, which, which of its actions, not just was correlated with the human being upset, but was responsible for the human being upset. Uh, and, and you want the agent to understand the human's intention when, when saying that they're upset, which is not to say, I don't want you to vacuum, but rather I don't want you to vacuum when I'm asleep. This requires a causal model of the world. Uh, causal, model, causal modeling is needed to understand a kind of folk physics. So what I mean folk physics, I mean physics at the level of how, say, you and I understand billiard balls bouncing around a table, not so much as you know, a, a deep simulation of um, you know, turbulence or something like that. And so if we, if we have agents that can do that, we, they can reason about mechanism, time, space, other kinds of hierarchies and taxonomies. Uh, so, for example, uh, Gary Marcus in his book, Rebooting AI, has a quote, we need to stop building computer systems and merely get better and better at, at detecting statistical patterns, data sets, often using an approach known as deep learning, and start building computer systems that, from the moment of their assembly, innately grasp three basic concepts, time, space, and causality. And, of course, you know, we just said... Two, three, a couple of things that, that make the kind of causal modeling approach seem critical of deep learning. Actually, deep learning researchers are diving into the fray, right? So uh, I think uh, no one more so than Yasha Bengio, who has uh, art, not only articulated publicly that, that we're, we're um, kind of blocked by, that deep learning itself is blocked by its inability to handle certain causal questions, but he's gone further at, to try and, he's defined a research agenda that's, incorporating uh, causal reasoning into the architectures that he's building. And so uh, he takes a very 
I know he quotes uh, Daniel Kahneman a lot talking about systems one versus systems two, or say systems one is the, uh, is where the neural nets tend to uh, kind of process low level signals and systems two is where the symbolic reasoning that's required for causal reasoning happens. And have you seen much uh, from him since that, uh, that October talk? Was that NURPS or I forget what- He's going to talk at NURPS. Um, this particular quote didn't come from that NURPS talk, but, uh, but he, um, and I don't know if the online NURPS in 2020, if he, if he spoke at, at, about this, but I know he's since then given a few talks along these lines. Okay. And, and, you know, the, so not only are we seeing an increasing number of causal related publications and workshops and tutorials, tutorials at these conference, but some of the other things that we're talking about, uh, particularly with, with the explainability and algorithmic bias, they are also, it, it, it's, it, uh, causality has a lot to say about those problems, right? So causal models are, uh, by definition, explainable because expl ex an explanation is all about explaining why and cause and effect. And in terms of algor algorithmic bias, you know, you take some of these traditional causal uh, causal graphs, and you you have a very you have a very good way of being explicit and rigorous about some of these topics that tend to be very controversial. In fact, in fact, when it, when a I, I I don't think that call, uh, causal inference, causal modeling uh, is the is is the is all you need to solve some of these problems. But what they do provide is a in a, a welcome source of 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 former of formality and and rigor in an, in an area that tends to be um, controversial and full of hand waving. So what I'm going to cover today really is just kind of talk about what a causal model is for people who are, are new to the idea and what it can do that canonical deep learning can do. You can incorporate deep learning in a causal model, but the kind of end-to-end -end deep learning that we're used to uh, can't reason causally, and we'll see why. Uh, we'll talk about what the big tech companies are doing about causality since they tend to be, they tend to tell us all how to allocate our resources in this community and uh, show you some of the, some good libraries to get started. And we'll talk a bit about the workshop. So what can a causal model do that canonical deep learning can't do? Best way to explain this is, is what we call the ladder of causality. We have three levels of query. So the first, the first level is what we're used to. It's called association or correlation. Say that given some variable X, say some features, we want to predict Y, say a label. Right, so given that somebody's on an exercise regime, we want to, we want to model, we want to predict their BMI. And this is a very, this is why uh, deep learning is is extremely successful here because, it if you if given enough data, it can fit very nuanced nonlinear relationships between x and y, even when x and y are, are have high dimension. Intervention is asks, so the next level up is intervention. Beyond that, we have the multiverse counterfactual. These two levels here are what we call, we need causal models to solve these. And, and we need increasingly, and this, this level here needs a more expressive causal model than what's required at this level. But uh, so intervention, if we force X to take a certain value, predict Y, right? So if I force someone to start an uh, exercise regime, say for example, I run an experiment and I assign them an exercise regime, what will the effect be on BMI? And this, so this big, this breaks down the standard machine learning that's learning a very good association model because the association model is just learning from the joint distribution of X and Y. But when I, that's the, the, the distribution that's is underlying the training data. But when I force X to take a certain value, I'm, I'm interfering in that distribution. I'm changing it because I'm intervening. I'm activating. I'm I'm acting on the system, and so that basically, from a machine learning standpoint, means that you're now trying to reason about a distribution that's different from the distribution that you trained your model on. And so, in order to to be able to capture this, we need a causal model that has an explicit representation of the relationship between cause and effects, so that we can we we can have an algebra of distributions. So we can say, hey, if I do if I do something to this distribution, what's the resulting distribution I expect to get out of it? 
and then I can reason on that, out, that output distribution. Multiverse counterfactual is saying, given X and Y, what would Y have been had X been differently? So let's say I've been, I've been cooped up because of COVID for over a year and I haven't been exercising. And, I have, and then after a year, I see my BMI. And then I might ask myself, what would my BMI have been had I exercised at home this whole year? Right. So this is not so much asking in general what happens when when you have somebody uh, start uh, start exercising. This is saying that given my given that I didn't exercise what and I and I have a high BMI, using both of those bits of information, try to predict what would have happened otherwise. And so not only does this require an explicit model of cause and effect relationships, but you kind of need a way to rewind time to that point of decision where I decided not to exercise, change the decision, and then fast forward again, keeping everything else constant except for the things that were affected by that decision. So here's how this that might look in, this ladder might look in a computer vision problem. Let's suppose that we had some kind of graphical representation of computer vision here so that we have some images. Uh, so we have a node here that's like a, uh, multi-dimensional tensor, tensor for pixels, and that we have some latent variables here for you know, the type of image that we're taking. So a, tra a person who's training, a boxer who's training, a boxer who's bloodied, and a boxer who's posing, the gender of the boxer, uh, and the boxer's ethnicity, and, and maybe there's some kind of background variables here that we're not representing explicitly. So that uh, there's some you know, there's some kind of causal processes that are affecting both both who which genders decide to be uh, uh, how members of different genders decide to be boxers and uh, how mem how members of different ethnicities end up being boxers and so we have so we're, we're kind of modeling that with this kind of causal process so in the association case imagine that we're just kind of generating from this this system right we just have a we have this generative model when it can generate images like a GAN. Well, the, if we just let it generate, the images it's going to generate are, are mostly going to be men because most boxers tend to be men. If we just count up all the boxers in the world, it's, it's going to skew male. male. Uh, in, now, if we do the intervention, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, I'm going to fix gender to female. So when I fix gender to female, all of these kind of background processes that influence uh, which genders and which ethnicities kind of go into um, boxing, they're, that's interfered with. I've kind of broken that relationship, right? So that's different from just kind of, you know, a probabilistic conditioning on evidence. This is more, I'm saying, I'm going to go in and change the system with an intervention and kind of like how you might go rewrite a line of code in a, in a model, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a function. And, and so now this rewritten model is generating only uh, uh, images of, of females. And then finally, the multiverse counterfactual says that we generate an image of a woman and we ask ourselves, so we generate anything. We generate, we just, hey, model gen generate something. This is what I get out. And then I look at this image and I say, hmm, what would this image have looked like if the ethnicity were different? Say, for example, if the ethnicity were Asian. And so you could not, so you're generating from a counterfactual distribution where the only things that vary in, in the distribution are things that are downstream of that ethnicity variable, while everything else is 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 held constant now some people who are experienced with computer vision are thinking like well yeah i know how to do that with deep learning i simply kind Gans, of uh, Gans. yeah I, I can kind of i have to go into the uh the training data and i have to say like okay here's a here's an image of a of a of a white woman and here's the and here and, and then i have this label asian and then i have this uh, asian alternative and then so like that's kind of how you you might go about doing a um deep fake right like where you say like okay well this is the part of the face that i want to change and then here's some um here's some uh seed faces from other people that i want to stick into this new face right so what you're doing there is you're accomplishing this task at the level of the training data and the, the, the training algorithm. All we're doing is taking that logic out of the data and the, uh, the, the training procedure and putting it into the model itself. And so rather than, uh, so it, this, this is something that's, this is a constant theme in, in this kind of generative modeling approach to uh, causal modeling. So we want to be able to say, um, you know, all the concepts that we use to define labels, for example, all of the, um, uh, all the abstractions that are important to us in the system, we want to we make them explicit in the model, 
rather than the um, uh, kind of procedures that we have in the in the training in the in the in the loss function in the uh, training procedure, and and that allows us to um, do a few things. Number one, it means that we have to we, we work with uh, far less data. It means that we get to uh, use our we get to focus on. In, uh, Letting, allowing the model to represent our, we, the time that we spent on the modeling process is focused on getting a model that uh, encapsulates our domain knowledge about the system. While in the former case, where you're focusing on a training procedure, you're focusing on tuning hyperparameters on, on, on maybe acquiring more data that can, that, and, and then actually labeling that data in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, and so, and, and if you can, and if you can get it to work, it means that you're going to be able to generate things. Uh, well, you'll be able to do ad hoc kinds of counterfactual queries. So rather than saying, you know, rather than kind of training specifically for this outcome here, I should be able to ask a counterfactual outcome uh, over any of these variables in my model. Uh, post hoc, after I've trained my model without, without maybe having planned to do that in, to begin with. Now, some of the folks may have heard the conversation that we uh, the brief conversation we had at the end of that Sean Taylor podcast episode. And uh, one of the points that you were making was that uh, you found that, um, you know, working with models from a perspective of causal modeling is just more fun. It's like more, you, you describe this flow state and uh, <clears throat> Is a, a lot of that I'm imagining is coming from the idea that you're, you know, kind of focused on the domain knowledge and your beliefs about the generative process and all that, and not kind of just the that eighty percent of data munging that we keep throwing around that number. Um, is yeah. that a part of where that comes from? Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to get better at articulating this because a lot of people. <laughs> Talk to they're just like fun. What do you talk to? Like, I want to build the most powerful machines, <laughs> and like, uh, and, and that sounds like I, I don't want to kind of create a trade off between fun and useful or practical or going to get you paid a large salary, right? Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I guess for me, like, there's been a few moments in my career where I learned some new technology, right? Like say, for example, I remember when I first learned how to take a kind of pro functional programming approach to data munging, um, which is, you know, a big, if you're, if you're a data scientist, you know, it's like 90% of your job. And, and it kind of, and, and it, it was such a, like, exp it was so much more enjoyable to, to, to do that element of work that way than the previous way that it actually became kind of almost a hobby. Like I remember sometimes I'll, sit there and kind of half watch Netflix, half like, you know, pull some data set from some website and explore it and kind of draw pictures and stuff. And, you know, the same in, in um, you know, one of the, you know, when probabilistic programming came out as a kind of extension of generative modeling, where you can, you're taking, you're taking, where they're encouraging you to take abstractions from your domain, explicitly represent them as uh, using code and, and then use that to, to model a probability distribution and then apply probabilistic inference to that system. But the code itself is more than just some kind of, uh, you know, probability model is actually an explanatory model of your, of your of the thing that you're, you're working with. And what that meant was that you got to spend your time thinking about how to take your problem and build the right abstractions in the domain in the language of the domain that you're familiar with. So, you, so in other words, if your model is not good enough, you need to learn more about biology or you need to learn more about economics as opposed to learning more about how to get the hyperparameters of your, of your computational graph to optimize correctly, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so, and, and, and the latter kind of being like, you know, to use a, you know, a phrase from, from Deng Xiaoping, like crossing the river by failing for stones. You're just kind of like, uh, I think this, I think I'm going in the right direction here. It looks better. Well, in the, in the former case, it's just like, oh, if I learn more about this domain, if I learn more about how in, uh, epidemics spread and in, in from epi uh, epidemiology that I can build a better epidemiological model here that captures the nuances of this data set. Mm -hmm. And so that's funner, right? Learning about the thing that you care about learning about is funner than learning about things you don't care about learning. Mm-hmm.
Um, and that has obvious I, implications on the things like explainability, which are uh, also important contemporary topics in machine learning. Are you, do you speak to that in the, this presentation? Not in this presentation, but you're, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, it's funny how, you know, it's kind of, there's this weird dichotomy where people in machine learning care a lot about prediction and less about explainability. And then people in, in social science, uh, in economics care, care a lot about explainability, um, but not much about prediction. Like they'll, <laughs> they'll have, they'll be talking about some mat, some very complex processes that they'll fit like a, a linear model and, and report a P value. And that's enough to get a paper. And you're like, you know, this, if you're, you're not gonna, if you try to trade stocks on this model, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna break the bank. So <laughs> it's like, nobody tries, you know? So like, I think, you know, one of the, the interesting things about kind of the Bayesian approach to modeling is that you get, you get the best of both worlds, which is that um, if you're, you know, kind of working with the posterior predicted distribution is always a function of your likelihood, which means that if you're, um, you know, there's an idea in Bayesian modeling called Bayes Occam's razor, which is that the, uh, the models that best explain the data tend, um, or, or rather best predict new data are also the models that best, this, uh, that provide the simplest explanations for the data. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if you're, if you're coming at this from a, Kind of Bayesian modeling standpoint, which we, we kind of emphasize in this class, uh, it um, you get you you kind of kind of evens out, and uh, so you get to you get to have prediction explainability uh, all for free. Mm -hmm. And there's also some nice results from causal inference that show like you know if you have the true causal model, then there's some assumptions that you make on your model. Say for example, some independence assumptions between parameters and um, you know, ideas of conditional independence, like Mark the Markov blanket, which which naturally reduces um, overfitting uh, in, in, a, in a semantically understandable way, as opposed to say something like dropout or some arbitrary regularization function. And so, you know, mo some of the things that you want to get out of a good model come directly from the semantics of the model, from the domain that you're that you're, that you're working in, as opposed to like some artifact uh, or property of an architecture or the syntax of a, of a problem like, you know, let's, let's take the log of the number of parameters and subtract K divided by two or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a lot more intuitive uh, when you take a causal modeling approach. You know, one of the things that's um, uh, actually a previous student kind of came up with this from the workshop, she said that there really isn't any kinds of, like we're, we're using machine learning to drive decisions, but it's very, very difficult to think of a machine learning problem, a prediction problem, where the prediction, the decision that you make doesn't affect future training data. The one example we can come up with is, let's say that you're training a model to, to predict the weather. So in the morning, you predict, you, you take some sensor readings and, excuse me, on humidity and whatever it is, parameters measure. And, and at the evening, you measure whether or not it was a nice day or a rainy day. So you collect that block of training data, you run it through your algorithm, your training algorithm, and then you start using it. So in the morning, you get a, you, you get some sensor readings, it predicts not to bring an umbrella, it was sunny, check mark, that was a good outcome. Next day, get some readings, says bring an umbrella, the decision is to bring an umbrella. The uh, it, it ends up raining. Check mark. You uh, good outcome. This next day, barometer reading says to not don't bring an umbrella, but it ends up raining, so that's a bad outcome. Uh, uh, don't bring an umbrella. Sunny, good. Uh, bring an umbrella. Sunny, bad. Now, uh, so as an aside, one might argue that this outcome, where you didn't have an umbrella on a rainy day, is worse than having a uh, having umbrella in a sunny day and uh, in our modeling approach of, especially if we take a Bayesian and slash causal decision theory approach to it, we can, um, we can, uh, you know, address that and with, with utility slash loss functions. But, um, most importantly here is that you're, um, you know, you're using this algorithm to make decisions, whether or not to bring an umbrella, but also your, decisions to bring an umbrella don't affect the weather, right? Like if I bring an umbrella today, it's not gonna affect the weather tomorrow. Weather doesn't care. But consider this case of advertising, right? So 
this is basically a mirror of the top case, except instead of rainy, uh, sunny day, I have an increase in, you know, I have a good quarter. And a, uh, instead of a, a, um, a, uh, so a sunny day, I have a good quarter, rainy day, I have a bad quarter. And uh, the, instead of a barometer, I have some kind of weather, I have some kind of report, you know, provided by a um, company like, I don't know, Forrester or something like that. And, uh, and then for the decision, the decision is whether or not to spend some advertising or to increase advertising budget to, uh, in order to, um, to, to do what? To affect uh, performance in the, in, in the next quarter or you know, perhaps, perhaps this quarter, depending on how you wanna model it. But in this case, your decision to run the ad or not based on the outcome of your algorithm, the prediction of your algorithm about whether or not it's gonna be a good quarter will affect performance in that quarter. Right? That's the goal. The goal of the advertisement is to have that effect. And so this is a real problem because you're now the, the activity motivated by your predictions are affecting the data that will now go into retraining the algorithm that generates the predictions. It's kind of like, a, it's like holding a microphone up to a speaker. And this can, and just like it makes a really awful noise with the speaker, this feedback loop will can, can, can generate a, a significant biases in your decision system. Now, in practical terms, it, it depends on how quickly the uh, decision is, uh, how strongly the decision affects uh, uh, future data and how quickly it does so. If it's, a, if it's a slow, like it takes a while for it to affect future data, you can just kind of retrain the algorithm as you go, not a big deal. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, you want you know if you're retraining very and you're retraining uh, frequently, and the the impact is um, felt by you know it, 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 the impact on future decisions is happening very soon. Then it can be a big issue. An example would might be a credit card fraud. Uh, I would you, you collect a, a payments company like Stripe is collecting data on on fraud. And of course, it wants to now try to block what it, it, it sees to be risky transactions. But of course, now the future transactions that actually get past the filter are weird fraud that somehow is so atypical that the algorithm that you learned on the untraining block one wasn't able to pick it up. So now the next time you retrain, you're, you're, you're biasing the algorithm to those weird edge case fraud fraud, which is actually going to, in terms of um, kind of, uh, it's, it's, you know, those frauds, that fraud got through because they look a lot like you know, normal transactions. And so now you're going to, you know, something like what, what might happen there is you end up blocking a lot of normal transactions because you're focusing on these very, um, very, very skilled cases of fraud at the expense of, you um, normal transactions and at the, ex at the expense of maybe dumber, dumber attempts to do fraud, which might get passed now. So that kind of bias is something that you really need a causal model to, to work with. Another example is reinforcement learning. So the reinforcement learning community is coming around to uh, using causal modeling to, to represent their, their, their problems. So this is the famous Bellman equation. I rewritten it so that it's using the do notation. So if you don't know what the Bellman equation is or what the do notation is, don't worry. But if, you're, if you've heard of these things, it's probably the first time you've seen them used together. But what we're doing is we're looking at the discounted expected future utility of being in future states, given that we do an action according to some policy uh, um, uh, that's according to some policy that's returning an action for us at, the, at, at, for, at state T. And um, that we're uh, you know, starting, uh, also assuming that we started at state, that we initially started at state S. And so if there is some kind of um, confounding between, if I, if I have some data of states and logs and rewards, and there's some, there's some confounding between, um, sorry, states and actions and rewards, and there's some confounding between states and actions or between utilities and actions, then that confounding can make would mean that the solution to this Bellman equation and the solution to the Bellman equation about this do notation would be different. 
and in terms of the solution in terms of finding the optimal policy. Now, what does that mean? It means that what I want to have is that I want to be able to look at the agents that I have in production and say, okay, based on these logs, had we given this agent a different decision-making policy, how much better would it have done, right? And I, and I could always run an experiment, but it'd be nice to have uh, an answer based on my past data before I run an experiment, especially if I have many experiments that I can choose from. Um, but even better would be to have the agent reason that way itself when it's learning when it's learning a, a good policy. So that's kind of how you learn, right? You didn't you didn't become, uh, you know, Sam, whatever kind of wherever you are in your life, you've you've done it by learning lessons along the way, as opposed to like playing your the game of life a thousand times and choosing the optimal policy. And so, and you do that by kind of reasoning about past mistakes, right? you know, ideas like regrets, right? So I did what I thought was best given what I knew at the time, but given what I know now, I believe I would have gotten more reward had I done action A instead of action B. I'm going to update my decision-making policy so I don't make that mistake again. It's probably a good time to uh, address probably the most frequently asked question I get about this course, which is, do I have to come in, you know, do I have to understand mathematical notation like that coming in? Do I need to understand, you know, Bayesian, you know, causal, whatever, you know, what is the prerequisite that's required uh, for a, a student to get something out of the course? So you should understand um, basic probability theory, basic statistics. And when I say basic probability theory, I mean like, understand what a random variable is, what a joint, um, or rather understand like what a probability distribution is, what it, um, what a conditional probability distribution is, uh, Bayes rule and what independence is, conditional and independence and conditional independence. Uh, the distributions that we'll work with in, in the course will mostly be discrete, right? So binary outcomes or categorical outcomes. And the reason now that doesn't mean that if you're, if you're thinking like, yeah, well, I'm kind of, I have this marketing problem where I'm marketing sales and sales is continuous or um, that you certainly can apply the ideas there. The great thing about uh, causal modeling, particularly from the way I approach the course is that the causal semantics of a problem and the statistical semantics of a problem are separate, right? So if it works for binary outcomes, it will work for a, you know, a, a real valued tensor with, with, with a dimension greater than one. And, and we have some tutorials in the workshop for people like, you know, say for example, doing a causal model on the image uh, for people who want to uh, tackle those kinds of problems. But if, um, but uh, as long as you understand kind of, you know, AP level probability, the kind of stuff that you, that, that I, the, the amount of, the, the amount of statistics and probability that a, that a data scientist um, uh, would be expected to understand and would be, is, is, all you, is all you really need for uh, this workshop. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the other, the probably the second question that uh, we get a lot is um, kind of what's, what's expected from a time perspective uh, in the course and um, you know, how much of a commitment does a student need to make to get something out of it? So, so the way, way I've structured this is that we have a weekly retrospective meeting. And I want it so that people, when they get, they get, a, you know, it, the, the, the lectures are rich. There are assignments that you can, that some people take all the time, they take a lot of time to go and just try and, and, and complete um, and get all the answers and then get, get feedback from instructors for you know, why they don't understand a certain question or something like that. And so a lot of people spend uh, a good deal of time trying to get the ideas out. And a lot of people just kind of want a high level thing. So for example, we had a previous student who was um, a, a project manager at uh, a product manager at DeepMind who was managing some researchers who were working with these types of problems. And he just kind of wanted a high level thing so that he could he can have conversations with these, he, you know, he, he had a background in, in, in data science. So it wasn't like he was kind of a complete novice to, to um, kind of, you know, data sciencey things, but he, uh, but, you know, he hadn't, he hadn't been familiar with this to these topics. So he wanted to uh, get a good overview 
so that he could um, have conversations with the uh, engineers he was managing who were working on deep on deep subtopics within this field. And so, you know, so he sh showed up to the weekly retros and there was times that he was more involved times he was like yeah i just had some stuff go on last week and i and so i'm just kind of i'm just calling in to kind of just get sp um, um, spun back up uh and and so it's it's designed to kind of go at your own pace but have a, a, a kind of a group participatory a participatory feel so that even if you miss something you can know exactly what you know exactly what you missed and you can get enough kind of a download that you can keep going without feeling too far left behind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that there's kind of a spectrum of outcomes where you can, you know, what you're really focused on fundamentally is giving people a framework for starting to think differently about these problems and kind of change the way that they approach even traditional problems um, by having this background uh, uh, in causal modeling and that language. Uh, but then you also have students that you know, have written papers together and have, you know, done projects and have, you know, taken it a lot further. Yeah, yeah, we had a few, I collaborated with a few of my students to write, I think three or four papers at this point. Um, and that's really just because, that's awesome. because I was interested in the topics um, and, <laughs> and, and they were already like people who wrote papers. Um, mm -hmm. so but not um, necessarily the, uh, the expected yeah, we don't expect you to write a paper to finish, <laughs> finish the workshop. Um, and uh, yeah, and then um, we've had people who were, um, I think actually probably more rewarding for me are, are people who've kind of stayed on to uh, participate in reading groups. And so we've had, we've kind of, I was talking earlier about explanations. We just had a reading group kind of go through this big reading list on the relationship between and explanations and causality in the in the cognitive psychology literature and kind of the algorithms behind that oh. uh, and so that's been rewarding uh yeah so it's anyway you know, and of course that's just kind of reading a paper or sometimes just just scanning a paper prior to the call as opposed mm -hmm. to writing a whole writing a paper yeah yeah so what exactly is covered in the course uh let's see uh, i can uh bring it up So while I'm bringing that up, like what uh, a good way to think about it is, so some of the, all right, some of the uh, people who are more interested, as what, so, uh, one group of people that I, I frequently get to the class are people who maybe come from a background in economics and, and they already know uh, one or two kind of methods that are used for causal inference in their domain and they have no real intuition for why they use it or how why or how they work, and so one of the, you know, one of the things that I, I think is good about this workshop is that we, we we introduce the kind of fundamental ideas for uh, causal modeling, and then we go through a bunch of practical causal inference methods, and explain them in the language of the ideas that we just spent the first half of the class or first half of the workshop learning right and so while if you wanted to really kind of learn about say for example some difference within differences approach to causal inference within kind of economics you'd have to read some papers but if you kind of already knew what that was but you had no you had no idea why it's supposed to work um you know after having the class you'll see not only how it works but how its relationship to other approaches um so this is the um curriculum. So we start off uh, using the causal graphical model as a substrate for building causal models, talk about um, uh, how we can reason about independence using graph structure, uh, particularly with using uh, D separation, other, uh, basically, we start about the basic assumptions you make when you build a causal model. So it's like if you, if you build any kind of model, especially a statistical model, like say regression, you articulate your assumptions in advance. Uh, like, you know, it's a linear fits, it's a linear model with um, constant variance and the errors are normal, for example. Uh, and then after you fit the model, you go and check those assumptions. Well, we do the same thing in causality. In effect, it's so our, our assumptions, like the Markov property, faithfulness, the minimality, sufficiency. Uh, some of these we can actually falsify with the data. Uh, because causality is something that is, is falsifiable. You should be able to go and look at the data and find evidence for the model uh, or against the model. 
uh, we uh, now we kind of convert this into a, uh, a, a generative machine learning approach to modeling, contrast it with, contrast it with the discriminative approach and uh, learn about interventions, be explicit about what they mean and how they affect a causal model. Um, then we look at how we program these causal models using probabilistic programming and what added uh, things that we get to say about causality by having a Turing complete high level programming language express our models. Talk about uh, structural causal models and how they allow us to reason about mechanism. We look at uh, what most people consider to be causal inference, which is trying, given some observational data, try to infer a causal effect. Uh, we look at the practicalities of implementing those using statistical methods and you know, so some propensity score matching and versus probability re-rating. These are just techniques that people use and you ought to know about them if you're going to go to a job interview and say you know anything about causality. Uh, I talk about potential outcomes, which is a kind of a an, another approach to causal inference that con contrasts with the graphical approach and how they're different and how, they're just, how they are the same. And then we look at trying to reason uh, algorithmi algorithmically about counterfactuals and some interesting quantities that we can reason there. We can think about there like mediation, which is really important for um, algorithmic fairness. Uh, there's uh, probability necessity and sufficiency, which is, is which is very important for figuring out, say, legal responsibility or blame. Uh, kind of like going back to that ro that robot example at the beginning. If I want to build agents that can reason about regret and uh, intention, and then we wrap it up. Awesome, awesome. Um, why don't we uh, why don't we open it up for Q and A? Uh, are there any questions in the audience? If so, you can uh, either raise your hand and we'll pull you on to ask live, or you can put your question in the chat. Uh, either of those is fine. Any questions? I see a question here about the titles to some papers, but I'm not sure what papers. Yeah, that, I think that's an offline question. Um, uh, Leonor is looking me, for the papers. I think the explainability papers that you mentioned, and we can maybe send that to her offline. And unless anyone else wants those, we can just let us know. I, mean, I don't know if I can list them off the top of my head, but if you, if you email me I'll, uh, or message me on Twimo, I'll, uh, Send you some stuff. Yeah, I am on the uh, okay. Uh, question from Phil Are there recommended tools for implementing uh, things like causal impact? Do you know that package? Uh, it's, I think it's it. I think I think the question uh, is what tools are you covering in the course or, or what tools are you, you thinking about? And causal impact is an R based uh, Bayesian structural time series. So uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, causal impact is based on is on Bayesian structural time series models. This is very much aligned with the kind of approach that we take here and the fact that in this in a sense that Bayesian structural time series has a kind of semantic approach to Bayesian forecasting like um, where you say like we're going to specify the model in terms of local linear trends and linear and um, uh, in other words kind of the trend components of a, of a time series you kind of make explicit in the model and then and then what they do here is just kind of is, is doing a kind of intervention that says like, all right, well, what would this forecast, how would this forecast have developed had we um, not had a big, um, uh, had, had some intervention happened at a certain time point. Uh, so we don't work with, so in the workshop, we're trying to teach you um, kind of how to build tools like this, right? So if you were, so in the workshop, we have, we, we invite people to do a class project collaborate with some other students. And if so, if somebody wanted to use um, causal impact to, to analyze some data and um, kind of use the use what we learn in class to kind of drive that modeling process, 
that would be welcome and we would inter interact with you. Um, we'll also teach you how to potentially build a tool like that. So one of the program we use, uh, we focus mostly on, on Python and a probabilistic programming language therein called Pyro, which is based on PyTorch. And, uh, and so that, uh, you know, that is designed, that's a, that's a general purpose probabilistic programming language. So it, it should, it, it could implement uh, tools like BSTS um, although BSTS is, uh, I've seen the code base, it's, it's, it's a lot. So I don't, it'd be a lot to try to shoot for in a class, but, um, uh, so, and so, so another example would be like, uh, Microsoft a guy named Amit, uh, Amit Sharma at Microsoft has a tool called do why, which is basically a interface for causal inference, right? So you're trying to figure out what the, you know, causal effect of, smoking on cancer is and you have some you have some data and so it'll you just you specify the cause and what the effect is and what some confound you know some adjusting confounder variables are and it will uh generate it'll run through several algorithms for calculating the causal effect and kind of just give you a menu of options to choose from and some and compare against but we'll study the algorithms directly and just figure out and, and learn ourselves how to implement them and so that way, when you pick up a, a package like causal impact or do I, you know what's happening under the hood and thus you know the limitations of the model. And um, you know, when you, if you don't, if you're using causal inference tools and you don't understand how causal inference works, it's really easy to get yourself in trouble. Hmm. Uh, another couple of questions that have come in. One, content wise, what's the difference between your course and Brady Neal's causal inference course, if you're familiar with that? Uh, and then general, I think this is looking for general comment on kind of industry adoption. Uh, causal inference is not taken off yet due to low accuracy. Any thoughts on that? Uh, lots. Um, so yeah. Uh, kind of remember uh, so Brady Neal so first off this is a a, a cohort based course so we're getting on calls and you have the ability to uh, schedule my time schedule the uh, the um, the time of other other instructors to kind of focus on the content uh, there is uh, in terms of content uh, there's some overlap with this course. So he covers, I'm just looking at the site now, he covers graphical models, he covers potential outcomes. Uh, he, uh, my, he looks at, uh, he looks at causal discovery. I talk, I talk about that. I, my PhD was in causal discovery. And, and um, there's some, uh, so I'm focusing more on giving you a graphical modeling framework that you can implement in code using a cutting edge auto diff uh, platform like uh, PyTorch to implement code. So it's really important to me that you can, if we cast causal models as generative models and use cutting edge tools for generative modeling, such as, uh, you know, probabilistic TensorFlow or PyTorch and with Pyro, then uh, we get, we can do causal reasoning with those cutting edge algorithms for inference in the, in that tool set. So that's a big focus. I'd say um, in terms of adoption, listen, there's a reason why I say how Varian is, a, is you know, it works at Google and um, other guys like, um, or other people who have a, a strong economics background at a work at these tech companies because it was, it was the economists with methods from econometrics who were the first to kind of to, to talk about, uh, uh, particularly in, in, the, in, the business, in, a, in a domain of business outside of public health, in a domain of business where people are trying to make money, how to go about um, uh, using eco uh, economic methods to, to, to uh, model data. And the reason they hired economists, people like Susan and Athey, was because they already had a language from econometrics for um, um, doing causal inferences. Say, for example, difference within differences. And the reason they needed to do that is because you know your the, the machine learning algorithms didn't really understand causality. So you go onto Amazon and you buy a and you buy a, uh, a laptop 
it's Amazon's recommendation algorithm should recommend a laptop bag. If you buy a laptop bag, Amazon's recommendation algorithm should not recommend you a laptop. But tools that reason in terms of cosine similarity can't tell you that. They don't understand that asymmetry that comes from like causality. Economists had a language for it, things like substitutes and complements, right? And they had econometric methods, which were causal inference methods. So the things that, so, so tools from econometrics uh, that they use to answer these problems, like structural equation models, uh, um, difference within differences, um, what do you say? What's, um, uh, Re, uh, reweighted, um, so you know, propensity score, uh, pr using propensity scores. These are all causal inference methods that we can. Th that if we if we if we learn causal theory, there's a there's a broad um, uh, overarching theory that kind of justifies all of these methods, which we cover in the workshop. And so, um, if you look for if you go to Facebook, if you go to Netflix, and you just go to their job page and you search causality, I guarantee you you'll find. Um, You'll find posts there, and it's and it's it's more on the data science side of the organization than on the machine learning side of the organization. I think in the future that's going to change. Um, one thing that I will say is true in industry is that uh, a lot of research causal inference tends to be focused on identifiability, which is to say, like you want to have something that is uh, where if you implement implement a method, the uh, bias of the method will shrink as you get more data. And in causal inference, it's really, it's really, it's, it's often the case that if you have a, the model specified incorrectly, that you just have a biased model and your, and your answers will be junk. Um, in, in industry, they, they tend to care a lot more about, they tend to already kind of have a good idea of what the causal models are and they're looking for ways of decreasing variance, right? So kind of, they, they know they have a good, they're pretty confident about how they're approaching the problem, but they're looking for ways of, 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 of increasing precision of the answers. And so that's definitely a thing. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour. We do have a, a few more questions that have come in, uh, but I want to make sure that uh, everyone knows how to enroll in the course if you're interested and some of the specific logistics. Uh, so the the first lecture is already available and there was a, sorry, say that again. First set of lectures. First set of lectures are already available. There was a kind of an orientation session uh, last week uh, and the kind of Tumul cohort will essentially be starting immediately um, so that uh, the, the content is available. The retrospectives will be on, uh, Sundays. What's the specific time, Robert? 11 AM Eastern. 11 AM. Uh, the notion of the cohort that Robert mentioned, I think is an important one based on the feedback that we've gotten from former students. They, uh, get a ton out of the pre-recorded content, uh, but they get even more out of the opportunity to engage with Robert one-on-one -on -one, as well and as yeah, the sure. other folks that are taking people the course. Yeah. People have interesting problems and they collaborate and they have, and they workshop, we workshop the problems. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, we invite you to, to visit the website, tomalai.com slash causal. We'll get you right over to the, uh, course page on Robert's site and uh, there's a, a discount code that you can use for an additional discount for the Twimmel community. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. If your question wasn't answered and you'd like us to follow up, uh, you can reach out to Robert and I on the Twimmel Slack or uh, via email. I'm Sam at twimmelai.com. Robert? I'm Robert at altdeep.ai. Altdeep.ai. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, follow up on your questions. Uh, but thanks everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, thank you, Robert, for once again uh, conducting this course and inviting our community to participate and taking some time to kind of share a little bit about you know, all that you've learned about causality and causal modeling. Thanks, Sam, for having me. And um, I, thanks, everybody. If you guys are 
you guys are busy people. So like, um, if you don't have time for the, um, for the cohort, go ahead and just reach out to me on Twimo and we can talk there. It's, um, I, I, I love community. I love Twimo. And so it's great to uh, connect. Awesome. Thanks everyone. And have a wonderful day.